All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the presentation, Making It Last, Preserving Your Family's Papers and Photographs. My name is Sean McConnell. I am an archivist here at the Rosenberg Library. This is the first presentation in a, of a series of webinars that we're having in August, the first three Saturdays in August. Um, the, the series is called Saving Your History. They all have the common theme of um, providing advice and information about how to preserve your family materials or materials from your community or your house. Uh, next week, next Saturday at 11 o'clock, Jamie Durham is giving a presentation about house research and preservation. Jamie works at the Galveston Historical Foundation. She's done a ton of research here. Uh, she's gonna be talking about how to research a historical home or property. Um, she does a lot with um, historical plaques, getting things on historical registries. So if you're interested in that topic, if you have a historical home yourself, or you just like learning about older homes, I highly recommend signing up for that webinar. And then two weeks from now on Saturday, the 21st at 11 o'clock, Sharon Gillens of the Moody Foundation is going to be giving a webinar about how your history matters, specifically your community's history. So while I'm talking about the individual family materials you'll have, she'll be talking about um, church archives or neighborhood archives or archives from um, different groups that have been underrepresented in the historical record, such as African Americans or Hispanic Americans. Sharon um, was a professor. She's a genealogist. She's given presentations in the past. She's very good at speaking about these matters. So I also highly recommend you signing up for her webinar as well. And last but not least, I did mention just a few minutes ago that we have preservation kits available. We ordered 30, I believe we have 10 to 15 left. They're available at the circulation desk. Um, they're free, they're first come first serve. They're gonna be containing a lot of the items that I mentioned in this presentation. And so if you haven't picked up one already and you're in Galveston, just go to the library circulation desk, show your confirmation email um, that you signed up for this webinar and you'll be able to pick that up. And I'll have a picture of the items at the end so you can see what we're uh, offering. But it is first come, first serve. Um, so make sure to come down and pick that up. All right, let's get started. So as I said, my name is Sean McConnell. I am the archivist here at the Rosenberg Library. The Rosenberg is quite unique among public libraries because we do have an archive. Most public libraries do not. An archive is a repository or a collection of historical materials that document the history of a specific place, specific time period, subject matter. Here at the Rosenberg, we document the history of Texas from the colonial era up to the Civil War, as well as Galveston from its founding to the present. That includes historical manuscripts, newspapers, photographs, films. It really runs the gamut. My job as archivist, one of my main uh, responsibilities is making sure that these materials last, that they're in the best state possible so that future generations can access those materials just as we do today. And so my goal in this presentation is to share some of the knowledge I've learned and the best practices so that you're able to preserve your family's papers and photographs, just like we preserve materials here at the Rosenberg Library. So let's get started. Families keep a variety of materials that may be passed down from generation to generation. These materials form the family's historical record. They tell your story. They tell where you came from, who um, your descendants are and what their stories were. And they include a variety of materials. They can be official records, such as birth certificates, marriage certificates, death certificates. They can include a family Bible that might have a family tree or a record of important dates. They can include scrapbooks, um, maybe scrapbooks of your children's extracurricular activities or your own activities. They can include photographs of holidays or vacations home movies showing the same thing. All of these things form 
a record of your life story and your family's life story. They all share one thing in common. That is, they are all unique. Once they are gone, they are gone forever. This is why archives differ from libraries. In a library, you have published materials. For example, if you lost your copy of a Danielle Steele novel or a Charles Dickens novel, you can probably find a copy of it at the Texas City Library or the Houston Public Library. But with archives, with these unique materials, once they're gone, they're gone forever. So if you lose your grandmother's letters from the 1930s, you're not gonna be able to go to a different archive or a different library and find those same things. That's why it's very important that we preserve these materials so that they last as long as possible. And you can learn how to easily handle and store all types of media from paper to photographs. And you can stop this from happening. I included this photo of film that's in a really bad state and I'll touch on that later on. But first I wanna start with paper. So I first saw this photograph a few weeks ago on Twitter. The British historian David Armitage shared it, and it's a pancake recipe. Um, you may be wondering why I'm sharing a picture of a pancake recipe. Well, this pancake recipe was written by the English philosopher John Locke. John Locke was born in the 1630s. He died in 1704, I believe. So this recipe is probably 350 years old, well over 300 years old. And what stood out to me when I saw this was the paper. If you look at it, the paper is pretty white. The ink is pretty dark. The writing is legible. You don't see any tears or really too many stains of the paper. Maybe some of the edges are a little wrinkled, but nothing too bad. It looks like the paper was folded at some point, but the, the creases aren't tearing. All in all, it looks in pretty good shape. Now I'm gonna show you a different type of item. This is the Galveston Weekly Tribune from 1957, I believe. And so it's not even 75 years old or getting close to that age. Um, but it looks quite different from that earlier recipe. The paper is yellowed with age. Um, you can see on the left-hand side that the ink is fading. The picture up in the top left corner is fading. The writing is fading. You can't touch it, of course, in the Zoom uh, presentation, but if you did touch it, the paper would feel very brittle. It would feel very rough and weak and fragile. And if you turn those pages quickly, they probably tear quite easily. So what happened in these intervening years? Why does this 350 year plus pancake recipe look to be in such great condition while this newspaper from Galveston from the 1950s is so yellowed with age and so fragile? Well, it's all about how the paper was made. Early forms of paper were relatively stable and long lasting. Paper from that earlier period were usually made out of linens or cotton um, without many chemicals or um, qualities that would uh, induce deterioration. However, paper produced between 1840 and the present um, is of a much worse quality. The reason is, if you think about it, in the 19th century, more and more people were becoming literate. Um, literacy was spreading. More people had leisure time to read novels. Urban areas were growing. There were, was a need for newspapers and these urban centers for a new reading public to read the news. So there was a need to have a larger quantity of paper produced as cheaply and as quickly as possible. So instead of that laborious, slow process of making paper from cotton or from linen, the new process was to use wood pulp from trees, ground down. The problem is wood pulp contains something called lignin, and this is very acidic. 
Um, you're going to hear me talk about acid a lot in this presentation. That's something we're fighting against. Acid is an enemy of preservation. Um, so this acid leads to brittle and discolored paper. It's the reason why the newspapers are very fragile after a couple of decades, why the paper turns yellow, why it stains, why it falls apart. So our priority is making sure that this acid doesn't attack the paper as quickly as possible so that we can preserve the paper and keep it as strong and as legible. How do we do that? Well, let me see. I'm sorry. I wonder if there's a way if I can get rid of this top section. I apologize for that. Okay, so heat and humidity are two enemies of paper. And these are two things that we know a lot about in Galveston, especially in this month of August. It's very hot and it's very humid. Unfortunately, these two things really are problematic for preservation. The higher the temperature, the quicker chemical reactions occur. I've read for every 18 degree increase in temperature, the rate of a chemical reaction doubles. Also high humidity levels for chemical reactions. These chemical reactions are what cause paper to deteriorate and change colors. Also, as we know in Galveston, heat and humidity work together to provide the perfect environment for pests and mold. Um, I included a picture of silverfish. I see a lot of these in my bathroom. Um, upsetting silverfish love to feast on paper, especially damp paper. Um, also, if you've had mold in your living space, you know that can stain things. It can spread very easily. Um, so these are things that we want to guard against. Well, how do we do that? Your first preservation priority, and I put this in caps locks, get your family papers out of the attic. Attics are generally hotter and more humid than any other part of the house. If you think about it, it makes sense, heat rises, the air in the attics is usually stagnant. Attics also experience more fluctuations in temperature and humidity. These fluctuations cause paper fibers to expand and contract, leading to brittleness. Um, so if you have a large fluctuation in either temperature or humidity or both, the paper is expanding and contracting a lot. And each time it does that, the fibers in the paper weaken and deterioration occurs more quickly. So you don't want to store all of your documents and family papers um, up in the attic. You don't want to stick them all in the garage. God forbid, you don't want to put it underneath the kitchen sink. All of these places are not good locations to store your stuff. It might be out of sight, out of mind, but if you want to make sure that these materials last for your children or your grandchildren, future generations, you don't want to have it in those locations. Store your materials in cooler, dark places away from pipes and sources of moisture. Um, so for example, you don't want to store them in a closet that's right next to the shower, the bathroom, because those are very moist areas and that humidity will seep through the walls. You'll want to find the place in your house or apartment that has the best temperature and the least humidity. The storage environment should ideally be below 72 degrees Fahrenheit and 60% humidity. And I say ideally, it's actually, it should be lower than 72 degrees and 60% humidity in an archival setting, preferably probably well below 68, now 65 degrees and 50% humidity. Um, but this is a point that is very important. Don't let perfect be the enemy of good. I know how hard it is, especially in Galveston or in Texas, to have a cool, uh, environment that's not very humid, unless you have an extremely good HVAC system and you don't mind spending a ton of money on your electrical, 
it's probably just not possible to have the ideal environment for paper preservation, something that's cool and not very humid. But we can still be proactive about making the best uh, environment possible within our own means. So I don't keep my apartment at 72 degrees. I usually keep it around 75 degrees. As long as you can find the place in the house that is the least humid and the coolest, that's good. Place it there. The important thing also is a place with the least amount of fluctuations. That's also something that's fairly within our, our means. Um, I remember hearing from a couple of colleagues and coworkers of mine that they used to turn off their AC when they went to work and no one was at home to save money on their electric bill. So the temperature would go from somewhere in the 70s quickly up to the 80s. They'd be gone for eight or nine hours. They'd come back home and then they'd turn that temperature, their AC on, and the temperature would go back down 10 to 20 degrees. Well, if you do that every single day, that fluctuation in heat and humidity is going to cause a lot of stress on your paper documents. So it's better to have as much as possible just a consistent temperature. I'd say no more than four to five degree fluctuation within a 25, 24 hour period, just to keep things as stable as possible. This is also important with pest control. Um, a lot of people use insecticides and those can be harmful to storage areas with documents. Some of those gases that come off from the insecticides can be harmful. So if you have an area um, that's clean, that you dust and vacuum often, that you make sure there's no, no uh, cracks to the outside where cockroaches or silverfish can come in, um, just to make sure that the environment is as ideal as possible so you don't have any of those infestations of bugs that like to eat and feast on paper. Don't leave stuff in piles where bugs or rodents will create nests. Just keep everything straight, um, clean. Uh, make sure there's good airflow. That's especially important with mold. You might not be able to have the coolest environment, but if you can have airflow going on, that will be a great um, means of keeping mold at bay because mold is another very bad thing for a paper. Um, so if you can have a place that's again, not in the attic, not in the garage where you have some good airflow, that will also go a long way to making sure your paper documents last as long as possible. So storage. Um, part of the kit is a document box that's acid free. I included a little drawing of one. I recommend putting your paper documents in these acid-free document boxes or in acid-free folders. Since paper, especially paper from 1840 to the present, which is probably most of what we have in our own family collections, is so acidic, it's important to put them in acid-free folders and bindings. That will counteract the acid in the papers, slow down those chemical reactions. Sometimes you'll have a document that's more acidic than another document. So if you keep those in separate folders um, instead of together, the acids won't leach onto one another. So please, um, please put your paper materials in some of these acid-free folders and document boxes. I am going to include a link to um, websites um, that sell archival quality materials. It's important that you go to these um, these businesses because I don't think you're going to find archival quality materials at an Office Max, for example, or at a Walmart. You'll want to spend something that has been tested to make sure that it is acid free. It can be pricey, um, but um, these are the best things to do to make sure that your materials last. When you are putting things into a folder, you don't want to stuff stuff into one folder and leave it just shoved into a box. I'd say place no more than 25 pages into one folder and then place folders into a box so that they easily stand upright. You don't wanna over, overstuff the boxes or let the folders slump because when that happens, the papers can warp um, or bend, they can tear more easily. You want things to be stable and facing upright. 
If you don't have that much stuff to fit into a document box, you can get some acid free board and sort of bend it and place it behind the folder so they stand upright. Or if you have some oversized items, such as a large scrapbook, you can get a flat box so that things are stored um, flat. That's also ideal, especially for those larger items. Before you do that, though, before you stuff, put, excuse me, put things into a folder and put it on a shelf, make sure that you go through all of your documents and receive anything that can rust, such as staples and paper clips, um, without tearing the paper. Believe me, they will rust. You might not think that um, the paper clip holding some letters together is that problematic, but a lot of the stuff that's brought into the archivist donations have rust on them. I included a photo from the Duke University Libraries. This is what will happen over time, especially when you're living in a humid environment. Um, that's why it's important to not store things with paper clips and staples. Just remove those. Even if they're plastic paper clips, those paper clips can cause the paper to bend over time. So it's better just to have nothing on them. If you want to keep things together, which is important, so if, say you have a five page letter from a grandparent, you don't want to store those in different sections or in different boxes because they're important to stay together. Just put everything into one folder by themselves. Or sometimes what I do is I'll take a piece of acid free paper, I'll fold it into half and then put the documents within that uh, folded piece of paper, just so that people know that all those papers go together. But don't use staples and don't use paper clips because those will cause a lot of damage over time. Consider making photocopies of newspaper clippings on acid-free paper. Newspaper clippings are probably the worst offenders um, they're highly acidic. It makes sense. Um, newspapers are mass produced. They're for a large audience. So more than anything else, people want to use some low quality, cheap paper for newspapers that contain great information. They have a ton of great content, but the paper is very cheap and acidic. So it's best to make photocopies of those. Even better yet is to make scans of them. Scans are usually of a better quality. I've seen some presentations from archivists who say just make photocopies and throw away the originals. Um, I'm of a different philosophy. I think it's better to keep the originals of everything. I'll touch on this more later on when I cover digitization, but the more copies you have, um, the better off you are because you never know if a copy will be lost or lost into a flood. Um, sometimes photocopies look worse than the, than the original. So make copies, but don't throw anything away if you have space to keep things. The reason also why I say that it's better to make scans of things is because, and this isn't something that I put on the slide, but it's also very important. Light damages paper and photographs. So the light from a photocopy machine is pretty strong. Each time you photocopy something, the paper or the photograph is damaged. Um, this is true of sunlight as well. Those UV rays are very, very damaging to paper and photographs. And it's cumulative and it's irreversible. So you might have a, a diploma, for example, framed and on your wall facing the west side, um, a large window with the setting sun coming in and the sun beats down on it every evening after a year. It might look fine. You might not see any uh, anything wrong with it. However, little by little, that sunlight or the light from a, a, a bulb is causing damage to the paper and it's accumulating over time. And then after a year, after a couple of years, the ink is fading, the paper is becoming more brittle, it's becoming discolored. So try as much as possible to keep things away from sunlight and try to photocopy things as sparingly as possible. Um, if you really wanna have your family photos or paper mementos on display for other family members or friends to see. I would rotate them, you know, have some family photos out for a couple of months and then get some other family photos and then put the other ones back into a acid-free box and put them in a uh, area that's low in temperature and humidity. 
um, or preferably just have them in a dark area um, permanently because if you put things on display that light damage will accumulate and it is irreversible. So that is important. Also, this, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, this surprised me when I first learned about it, but wood is very damaging to materials as well. I think wooden furniture looks really nice. Wooden cabinets are very attractive furniture pieces, but wood is highly acidic. Um, makes sense if the paper being made from trees is highly acidic today, well, the wood is highly acidic. And some trees, some types of wood are worse offenders than others. Um, nice oak cabinet, oak is really bad. Um, I think walnut wood might be the least damaging to materials, but all wood will release gases that damage your paper or photographs. Also cabinetry usually contains adhesives, those offset gases, um, all that is damaging. So again, it's better to put all of your family documents into acid-free folders and acid-free document boxes and not into a wooden filing cabinet. If you do wanna have things in a cabinet, it's probably best to have a powder coated stainless steel um, filing cabinet. Just don't use wood, don't store things into a wooden chest. Over time, that will lead to damage. Excuse me. Okay, let's move on to photographs and film. Photographs and film need the same environment as papers. Um, generally speaking, as in not very hot, not very humid, they actually need a colder environment and a less humid environment than paper. Um, ideally, the temperature should not exceed 68 degrees or 60% humidity. Again, ideally for an archival setting, it should be colder than that, especially for color photographs. Those should be in cold storage. But this is what we can do um, within our own means. Again, if you don't have a state-of-the-art HVAC system and don't mind spending a ton of money on an electric bill, um, you can't have this cold storage for photographs and film. However, you can do things within your means that's proactive and really slows down these damaging processes. So photographs should be stored in, stored in cool areas that are not very humid. Um, on the other hand, humidity should not drop below 30%. Um, this is probably not a problem in Galveston or throughout the Southeast, but if you live in a desert environment that gets extremely dry, it's something to consider. The emulsion, the part of the photograph that contains the image, that can dry out and crack. So you wanna have a storage area that's not too dry, but not too humid. And as I said about light, especially with photographs, you don't wanna have photographs on display where there's a lot of ultraviolet light. This light will cause deterioration and it will cause the photographs to fade. Especially color photographs, but all color photographs, or excuse me, all photographs are really susceptible to fading and damage from ultraviolet light. Many photographs and negatives have a tendency to curl. So store photographs in archival quality enclosures and place in boxes that are not overly stuffed. I mentioned this with papers, equally true with photographs, um, especially negatives I've noticed. Negatives um, are really susceptible to curling. So you wanna have them stored either upright, straight, or uh, flat and horizontal. Um, because those photographs and negatives will really curl over time if you have them slumped. Photographs and film may require similar environments as paper, but they also have unique needs. There are a variety or is a variety of photographic media with different preservation concerns. There's been a ton of different photographic processes over the past couple hundred years with different um, materials used. So some of these have different preservation needs and I'll go through some of the ones that you might find in your own family collection. Many 19th century photographs are albumen or gelatin printing out papers. I included one from our collection. That's an albumen picture. 
Um, you might know it as a carte de visite because there are these little photographs on cards that people would hand out to their friends. Um, sometimes later on in the 19th century, you might have larger ones that are called a cabinet card. They're called albumin because it's made out of egg white. Albumin is another name for egg white. They mix the egg white with some other chemicals, put it onto a base, and then took the photograph. Um, the reason why they're often placed onto these carte de visite um, or cabinet cardboards is because they have a really strong tendency to curl. Um, so if you do happen to have one of these photographs that aren't on a board um, already, I recommend enclosing them between um, two pieces of alkaline buffered board. Just put them between, maybe wrap them up, not too tight, um, but enough so that they don't shift and that will keep them flat. And this is an important thing too. I say alkaline buffered board. So there are two different types of acid-free products, acid-free folders and boxes and so on. There's buffered and then there's unbuffered. Unbuffered means, for example, that the folder has no acid. So it's on the pH scale, scale it's pretty high. Um, if it's buffered, however, it has an added alkaline element, usually calcium carbonate, I believe, added to it. So it provides extra strength against acids because acids from the papers will migrate um, to the other pieces of paper over time. So if you have papers in an acid-free folder, the acids from the papers will migrate to those folders, making them acidic as time goes on. If a folder is buffered with that alkaline, that process is gonna be much more slow um, and there'll be added protection. However, even though most items, most papers and photographs will benefit from that buffering, there are some materials that are not um, ideal, that should not be placed in buffered folders or between buffered boards. I'll describe those shortly. Um, they would benefit from just unbuffered materials. One of those is something called a cyanotype. You may have these in your family collection. They're not as common um, as the carte de visite that I showed you. I read a statistic that 80% of photographs from the 19th century that have survived are those albumin or gelatin printing out paper photographs. But I've seen quite a few of these cyanotypes. The one that I've included in this presentation is one from our own collection. And you know it's a cyanotype if it has that really brilliant blue color. They were first created in 1842, but they became popular in the late 1800s. The thing about cyanotypes are that they are susceptible to abrasion. So they should be carefully handled while wearing gloves free of any scratchy particles. And this is something that I wanna bring up too. Um, a lot of times when people come up to the archive, they're excited to wear gloves. And sometimes they see us not wearing gloves and they wanna know what's going on. Well, we provide cotton gloves when handling photographs because there are always oils on your hand and those oils, when you touch the photographs will damage them. So it's really important when you're handling photographs to make sure that you have clean cotton gloves on make sure they're clean because they get dirty really easily. Um, and if you're handling a cyanotype, especially make sure that they don't have any scratchy particles on them. People in the past, archivists in the past, would wear gloves also when handling paper documents. A lot, a lot of archivists have moved past this practice when handling paper because um, paper becomes very brittle. And sometimes that cotton in the gloves will latch onto the paper particles and cause tears. Um, it's harder to tear pages, for example, in a newspaper volume when you have cotton gloves on. So sometimes it's better just to make sure that you have washed and dried your hands thoroughly and handle paper instead of wearing cotton gloves. Or if you have some latex or nitrile gloves, those are better too. Um, but by all means, when you're handling photographs, make sure you have gloves on. When you're handling paper, make sure your hands are very clean and dry or wear some nitrile gloves but make sure that you're not handling things with dirty or oily hands. 
Um, but I, as I mentioned about that buffered material, cyanotypes, and also blueprints, if you have some blueprints from your home that you want to preserve, um, they should go into some safe storage um, encapsulation, for example, a large folder, but you don't want to use buffered um, acid-free materials because that alkaline compound will damage those cyanotypes and those blueprints as well as um, charcoal paintings or watercolors. So if you had an artist in your family and you want to preserve their drawings or their paintings, you don't want to put um, those materials in buffered acid-free materials either. Just make sure that it's unbuffered. Many black and white photographs from the late 1800s to the present are gelatin developing out paper prints. This is different from gelatin printing out paper. These are gelatin developing out paper. And this is, from my own experience, the bulk of what I find um, from the 20th century, from the 1920s through the 1970s or so. Develop, excuse me, gelatin developing out paper prints do not fade and deteriorate as quickly as albumen or POP prints, but they do contain silver particles and pollution, heat, and humidity cause these silver particles to oxidize. And you might have some photographs in your own personal collections that start looking very shiny, as you can see in the picture that I included, especially around the edges, it looks very silver silvery, if that's a word, silver-like, um, that will happen with high heat, humidity, and pollution. Um, so you want to keep these gelatin DOP prints in a very cool environment with low humidity to help slow this process. This is my, I think, favorite type of photograph. It's called a platinum print. Um, these also were created, I believe, in the 19th century, but I think most of from what I've seen are from the late 1800s through the 1920s. These prints contained platinum. They might be called palladium prints because during World War I, platinum was not easy to get. It was used for other, um, other things during the war. So people switched to something called palladium, I believe. I'm, I'll be honest, I'm not exactly sure what that is. Um, but they look quite the same. I like them because um, they have this really rich color scheme. They're usually a warm uh, color. They have a lot of tonal um, uh, differentiation. In my experience, they don't deteriorate that much, so they don't have as much as the fading or the oxidation that you see from the gelatin developing out paper prints or the albumin prints or the cyanotypes. They, they look really clear, have a lot of nice detail. However, what's really interesting about these prints is that they cause something called image transfer. And I'll show you an example shortly. Um, what that happens means is if you have the print stored against something else, over time, the image will transfer onto the other item. So they shouldn't be stored with other materials. Um, they should be kept away from natural light, like all other photographic or paper documents, um, just so that they're preserved as long as possible. If you do want to include multiple prints into one folder, for example, I suggest taking a piece of acid-free paper and interweaving between, just so that image transfer doesn't happen. I'll show you an example right now. This is from our collection. This is a photograph of James Stubbs. We received multiple copies of the same photograph probably 100 years ago, and they were stored together. Well, over time, the image on the right leached onto the board on top of it. As you can see on the left-hand side, it looks like almost a photocopy or a ghostly reproduction on that, on that photographic base. So this is really important if you have a, a letter from your great-grandfather together with a platinum print of them, that photograph will transfer onto the letter. So you want to make sure that they're either stored separately or that there's a piece of acid-free paper internally weaved between them so that this image transfer does not happen. Let's get to negatives. So cellulose, cellulose nitrate film was invented in 1887, 
And this type of film comprises most of the early negative film stock. Filmmakers and photographers used cellulose nitrate until the late 1940s and early 1950s. I believe it stopped being produced in 1951. Um, so anything after that, it's probably not cellulose nitrate, um, but especially those early negatives from the 1900s, 1910s, 1920s, they're likely nitrate. Unfortunately, these nitrate negatives emit nitrogen dioxide as it deteriorates. Um, that photograph, if you remember from one of the first slides in my presentation showing the film reel that had turned into this yellow muck, that's what happens when nitrate deteriorates. And it, I believe it's an inevitable. You can't stop it from happening over time. You can slow the process down, but it's going to happen at some point. Um, it will turn into uh, this yellow type of guck. Also, unfortunately, cellulose nitrate is highly flammable and unstable. So if you do have nitrate, you can't throw it into your garbage can and put it out in the curb because it is considered a toxic hazardous waste. You'll wanna contact your local hazardous waste, hazardous waste agency to see how you can dispose of it. The other thing about nitrate, um, it is highly flammable. It also is self-combustible. So there is always a chance that it could self-combust. I wouldn't be too concerned about that if you have it in your own family collection, because I think it has to be in a really large quantity in a really hot environment. So for example, um, I believe fires have started in some old warehouse in Southern California where they had old film reels from the, from the silent era and an un, um, an environment that didn't have any um, HVAC system. Um, I think for the most part, if you just have a few uh, negatives and it's in a pretty cool environment, you shouldn't be too concerned about that. But I do suggest digitizing those as quickly as possible because they will deteriorate. And sometimes um, it's harder to tell if it's nitrate or something else. Sometimes on the edges of these negatives, it will say nitrate or it will say safety film. Safety film is something that was created later. Um, safety film is another name for cellulose acetate film. This was created in 1937. And this is what you see a lot afterwards throughout the 20th century. Um, it's called safety film because it's not as hazardous as cellulose nitrate. It's not as flammable, it's not prone to self-combustion, but it is still prone to deterioration, particularly something called vinegar syndrome. Um, over time, the negatives will start to curl and deteriorate, and they'll emit this odor that smells just like vinegar, um, except it's even stronger and it will make your nostrils burn. So, if you do have a lot of negatives and you start smelling that vinegar, I highly recommend going through them, determine which ones are giving off that odor, and then separate those negatives from the rest of the collection because <clears throat> the odors, <clears throat> excuse me, the gases um, from those deteriorating negatives will cause the other surrounding materials to deteriorate much more quickly as well. So periodically go through your family materials um, good practice anyhow to make sure there's no insect infestation or mold, but also to make sure if you have these negatives that they don't have this vinegar syndrome because you will want to separate them from everything else so that the deterioration doesn't spread. I included this picture. I, I think I pulled that from the internet, but you can see that the emulsion is beginning to bubble up. It has this spider web quality to it. Um, that's what happens when these negatives start to deteriorate. Uh, let me go back. Um, oops, sorry. For photographs and negatives, ideally it should be in cold storage, so refrigerated um, environment, something that's extra cold. Not your refrigerator in your kitchen, those are probably way too humid. Um, if you do have a large valuable, either monetary or sentimental um, valuable uh, negative collection, um, 
and you have the resources to spend on an archival quality cold storage unit, I do recommend that because that will slow down the deterioration, but negatives should have a colder environment than your paper documents, for example. But again, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Do what you can within your means to slow down these um, deteriorated deterioration processes. So as a solution to all of this, um, digitization is a great, great way um, to create backup co copies of materials and to preserve the content, at least. You might not be able to always preserve the paper or the photograph, but if you scan them, you'll be at least be able to have a representation of the content. This is also really helpful, <clears throat> excuse me, because the more you handle things, the more things are exposed to light, um, the more quickly they deteriorate. So if you create a high resolution copy of something, you can keep things in storage and keep them more preserved while you handle something that's been printed out or something that you can view on your computer screen. Um, that's why um, a lot of people wanna see our Storm of 1900 photographs. We've digitized everything and we show people the digitized copies because those photographs are so valuable, so highly requested and so old, we wanna keep those in a cold, stable environment so that they last as long as possible. And we provide those digitized copies so that people can still access the content without having to access the originals. If you decide to digitize your family's papers and photographs, make sure to create something called a TIFF file. So usually when you're scanning something, you have a couple of options. Um, one is JPEG, the other is TIFF. A lot of people create JPEGs. Um, they're faster to scan and create. Um, they don't take up as much um, space on your hard drive. But there are unfortunately something called lossy. So each time you open up a JPEG, it loses a little bit of that information. So over time, as you open it, or if you copy and paste it to a new location, it's losing more and more of those bits that provide <clears throat> the means for the computer to represent the photograph or the document. TIFFs, however, those are stable. They're not lossy. So you can open them a hundred times. You can copy and paste them from your desktop to a flash drive, and they're not gonna lose the information needed to represent them on the computer screen. They are larger, but they're more stable. So if you're gonna scan your documents or photographs, I highly recommend that you create them as a TIFF file. DPI, that stands for dots per inch. That's the resolution um, that you can set when you scan your items. They should, the DPI should range between 400 and 900, depending on the size of the item. Um, try to have 6,000 pixels along the long side of the image. So if you have an eight by 10 uh, photograph that you're scanning, it should be 6,000 pixels along the 10 inch side. You'll be able to see that when you place it on a scanner, get a preview scan. And then when you're going to outline the section um, to be scanned, you'll see at the bottom how many pixels it is. Make sure um, on the long side, it's at least 6,000. And then um, uh, set your DPI accordingly. Store digitized items on multiple formats, such as on a flash drive and on your computer, as well as a cloud format. So if you have access um, to the Google Cloud, I would also store it on there. Um, follow best practices for naming files and remember locks. This ties into multiple copies. Locks is something that we say in the archival field. It stands for lots of copies keep stuff safe. So if you have a copy of an item on your desktop and you have a copy of an item on a flash drive and you have a copy of an item in the cloud, in the Google virtual environment, that's great because if something happens to your desktop computer, if you spill chocolate milk on it and it's destroyed, or if you lose the flash drive, you'll have another copy to go back to, or if something's accidentally deleted, or if um, say a file starts to deteriorate itself, which is a whole nother topic, you have another copy 
um, that you can use. So lots of copies keep stuff safe. This ties into what I said about making copies of your newspaper articles. Don't get rid of the originals. The more copies you have, the better off you are. If your, God forbid, house floods, um, if you have multiple copies, one stored downstairs and one stored upstairs, at least it's not lost forever. The content isn't. Also remember that light emitted from scanners adds to the irreversible damage caused to materials. So scan each paper or photograph as sparingly as possible. And um, this ties back also to what I said about photocopying. Um, if you have access to a scanner, use the scanner instead of going to the library and photographing your family's photos on the photocopy machine. The photocopy machine's light is very strong, um, so it'll cause more damage. Photocopy machines also emit ozone, um, which will damage photographs and paper documents. On the other hand, scanners have um, less UV light, um, so not as much damage is happening. And I don't think they emit ozone, or if they do, it's much less than a photocopy machine. So it's better to use a scan scanner instead of a photocopy machine. You also can get a much better resolution. Um, so I definitely recommend using a scanner instead of a photocopy machine. Let's see here. Also, the heat from a photocopy machine is more damaging than a scanner as well. So to summarize, store materials in an area with low humidity and stable temperature, preferably under 72 degree Fahrenheit and 60% humidity. House materials in acid-free folders or sleeves and store in acid-free boxes or steel filing cabinets. Make sure storage area is free from dirt, dust, and insect infestations. So don't put things in a big pile and just throw it on the floor. Keep it organized, keep it stored um, upright or flat so that they're not slouched. Um, keep things dusted, make sure that there's no cockroaches or silverfish feasting on your precious family documents. Um, make sure there's no mold growing. Um, keep things well vacuumed, crumbs free. Um, other, another thing that I wanna point out too is if you do use household cleaners, those can be damaging to your materials as well, especially if they have ammonia. Um, those gases can cause deterioration to happen for paper and photographic materials. So try not to use those around where you store your items. If you do choose to use some household cleaners to call germs, for example, or to really get a deep clean, I recommend moving your materials out of that room for a while, let the air clear, and then put out, putting them back. And make sure also that wherever you do store them, that there is a nice circulation of air um, to keep from mold growing or insects um, finding a human environment to reproduce in. Keep materials away from light sources for long periods of time. Um, don't hang them up on the wall where the sun's beating down. If you do do that, make sure you to rotate items so that they're not constantly um, being subjected to light. Hand materials with clean and dry hands or wear clean gloves. Always wear gloves when you're handling photographs and then use nitro gloves when wearing or handling documents or just have clean and dry hands. And create high resolution digital copies. Scan or photocopy sparingly, however, but make sure that you have copies of everything. Copy and paste your TIFF onto couple flash drives or on the desktop in the cloud. Lots of copies, keep stuff safe. And don't be, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Sometimes less is more. This is especially true when you're trying to fix problems. Uh, so there is a difference between preservation and conservation. Preservation is making sure damage does not happen to create the most ideal environment possible to prevent damage. Conservation, on the other hand, is fixing damage that has already happened. Um, so if you have a letter from your grandfather that has a large tear in it, sometimes less is more. Don't put tape on it. Don't, um, don't try to mend it in any way because that can cause damage, especially if you're using tape. Um, get a nice, uh, polyester or polyethylene sleeve 
um, and place it in there or put it into an acid-free folder. But um, sometimes when you start putting um, tape or adhesives on things or start trying to do conservation work, it can cause more damage um, than good. If you are interested in fixing damage that has already happened, if you have materials that have a ton of mold on them, or if you have photographs that are stuck together and you want them separated, I would contact a conservationist. Um, conservationists have a nice uh, understanding of chemistry, which I unfortunately lack, but you need to have that understanding of chemistry to be able to have the right products to separate things or to remove mold and so on. So um, what I'm talking about is preservation, but if you have conservation concerns, that is a different topic, um, and I would recommend contacting a trained conservationist. Here are some vendors um, to, to look up if you're interested in, in getting products. Um, www.archival.com. Um, Gaylord and Hollinger are two very well-known, reputable companies. We've received products from both companies. Um, so I really recommend either going to Gaylord or Hollinger Metal Edge. The preservation kits that we're giving out, I believe those are from Hollinger. Um, so again, those are highly reputable companies. I would go to those websites if you're interested in buying acid-free paper or acid-free folders, document boxes, and so on. University Products is another business. I don't believe I've ever ordered anything from them myself, but it's another good resource. If you have any questions, the Northeast Document Conservation Center, again, for conservation as well, they are the best in the business. They're located in Andover, Massachusetts. We're actually um, partnered with them right now. We sent most of our oral history cassette tapes up there to be digitized. They are leaders in the field. So if you go to their website, I'm gonna pull it up shortly, but www.nedcc.org, they have a wealth of information on preservation and conservation. Here is a picture of the archival kits that I mentioned. Um, some of you have picked them up, but some of you haven't because we have quite a few left. I think we have 10 to 15 left. Um, they include a document box that's acid-free, the little binder that's upright on the table, that's um, a photo album, and there's some plastic sleeves that are um, tested to not give off um, gases. So you can put your photographs in those plastic sleeves and then place them into the binder. Um, include those white gloves that are really helpful to wear when you're handling photographs. Also has some pencils. Again, I didn't mention this before, but it's important if you're taking notes, always use a pencil. Ink will transfer through the back of a photograph um, or if you're using ink to write down notes and you write down something on your great grandparents birth certificate or something like that, it's extremely hard to get ink off without damaging the original. So always, always, always use a pencil and write lightly because if you make a state, mistake, you can erase it um, and uh, the pencil is not gonna cause anything to go through the paper or through the photograph. So yes, this, this item is available at the library, first come, first serve. Just show that you signed up for this webinar, show the confirmation email. Um, or if you sign up for the presentation next week or the week after, you can show that as well. Um, show the person at the circulation desk and they'll be able to give you your preservation kit from Hollinger Metal Edge. Um, it's free, it's for yours to take, but it is first come, first serve. So once we run out, um, we've run out. I'm gonna go to my screen now. Let's see if I can get out of this. Intro. Okay. I wanted to show you some of the websites that I just mentioned. So this is Gaylord um, Archival Products. This is where you can go and find all of your supplies if you're interested in buying some of the things that I mentioned today. This is the NEDCC website. At the top, if you go to preservation leaflets. This is where I am right now. They have all these little preservation topics. 
So if you want to learn more about the, these things that I've been talking about today, want to have more um, detailed and depth information, this is the perfect resource. Um, so if you're interested in the environment, click on that. We'll have a ton of information about having the best environment possible. If you're interested in storage and handling for um, books, they have stuff on that. If you're interested in photographs, um, especially if you're interested in different types of photographs, they have pages for that. So let's click on this, 19th and early 20th century. We have examples of each um, with different types of information. So this is a really, really great resource for getting more information. And if you are interested in conservation as opposed to preservation, if you have materials um, that unfortunately do have damage already, there's something that the National Park Service has created called conservograms. I found these really useful in the past. Um, just Google National Park Service conservogram, you'll get to this page. And they have um, all these different leaflets about how to um, conserve things. <clears throat> Excuse me. Covering infestations, covering UV damage, archaeological objects. If you have anything of those in your family collection, um, wooden objects, leather and silk, so on. So this is much more detailed too. If you have any questions, I would highly recommend taking a look at this. Some things you might be able to do on your own, um, but if you can't, if you're afraid of causing more damage, Again, I highly recommend contacting a conservationist. We've sent stuff out to a, a company in Houston. So that concludes what I have to say. Um, I think there are some questions, so let me go through those. What is the best way to preserve modern photos which are on a map board? Well, if there are Glue to the map board, I recommend doing the least amount. Um, so don't try to separate anything from the board. That might cause more damage. The board may be acidic. Um, that's possible. But if you can store something either in an acid-free folder um, or an acid-free um, uh, envelope, you could try that. That will counteract the acids in the board. Uh, make sure to scan it. Um, scan it at a high resolution and save it as a TIFF, save multiple copies, and then make sure that those photographs aren't exposed to light, um, especially too often. If you want to see the photographs, look at the digital, digital copy um, or take out the original um, sparingly. Um, but don't try to separate it from the map board. If you do want to do that, though, contact the trained conservationists because they would probably have to do that for you. There's chemicals involved and so on. You wouldn't want to do that yourself. Um, is a scanner available at the library? We get this question a lot. We unfortunately scan, we ourselves can't scan things on other people's behalf. I believe there is a scanner, scanner available on the third floor, um, the computer lab. Correct me if I'm wrong, um, if any of my colleagues are listening right now. I think you can go to the third floor and scan materials that's available. Unfortunately, we can't do it for people, but I believe you can go to the computer lab. Yes, there is a scanner. Okay, thanks. Is it recommended to transfer old home movies, 40s to 50s to digital? Is there a danger that can be damaged, destroyed in the process? So this is a really good question. I don't have much experience with film. Um, but let me show you a website. There is um, there is something called the Texas Archive of the Moving Image, and they had an event here in 2016, I believe. Let me get this down. So they came to the library. Um, we collected home movies from the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, any period as long as it was of Texas, of our Texan family. And they digitized everything for free. So it was sent to Austin, I believe. They created digital copies. And then they sent back the original along with a, a DVD or a, or a flash drive containing the digital copy. 
they'll do it for free. I believe they still will, but they, but the catch is they need to be able to put it on their own website. So if you're okay with your family movies being digitized and placed on their website, um, they will do that for free, I believe, and then give you the original and the copy back. And there was no um, harm done to, to the film um, in the process. They were able, I believe for the most part, just to be able to digitize everything, then hand everything back. So if you're interested in digitizing your, your films, um, not your negatives of photographs, but your actual films, um, I, I recommend contacting the Texas Archive of the Moving Image. Let's see. What is the best way to remove a picture which is stuck in the glass frame? Again, that's a little bit outside of my area of expertise that involves conservation. Um, I believe there might be an organization that has a directory. Let me see. Um, Let's try a museum. So the American Institute of Conservation has a document uh, directory, excuse me. Um, I would try to find someone through here. If you do wanna be able to remove things um, that's stuck to glass or stuck together, that will, call, that will um, sorry, that will require a professional service. Um, I don't recommend doing that on your own. Um, because it will involve a lot of care, um, probably some chemicals. So try to find a trained conservator to do that for you. Yes, the archival kits came from the Hollinger uh, Metal Edge Company. Um, so they're of excellent archival quality. What would you recommend doing if paper photo documents are laminated? Well, first of all, don't laminate anything. If you have already, it's too late, but lamination is not a preservation uh, procedure. The chemicals in the lamination, the heat, that will damage the materials. It might look nice, but you don't wanna laminate anything. It will deteriorate over time. Again, that's conservation work. So if you do wanna have something that's where the lamination is removed, um, I would talk to a trained conservator. Um, See if there will be any damage to the original that happens. Sometimes it might be better just to leave it as is, create a high resolution copy. Um, so you at least have the content scanned and preserved. Um, but if you're wanting that lamination removed, don't try it yourself. Find a trained conservator. My old movies were filmed in Louisiana. Does Louisiana have a similar archive? I'm not sure. I haven't heard anything except for the Texas archive of the moving image. Um, however, you might want to try that NEDCC. Um, they might be able to do that for you. It might cost some money, but they might be able to uh, either do that for you at cost or they might be able to point you in the right direction because they are digitizing um, cassette tapes and films. Um, and they're, they were really responsive to me when I was inquiring about our own cassette tape collection. So I recommend for digitizing some of these films um, if you're outside of Louis, uh, excuse me, if you're outside of Texas, um, contact the NEDCC. Can plastic do more harm to paper or photos? Yes, um, that's a really good question. So if you are going to be using plastic, make sure that you buy the plastic from Hollinger Metal Edge or from Gaylord or some of the similar quality companies because they'll have the best plastic possible that's not offsetting these gases that will cause damage. But even then, if you have, um, let's say a really fragile letter where the, the papers are flaking off or the edges are flaking off, or if the emulsion on the photographs flaking off, you don't wanna place those in plastic. The problem is with the plastic, static electricity can develop. And when you open it up, it can cause further tears or further damage to the materials. Paper or the photographs in really good condition, it's not a problem, but if it's beginning to flake, if it's beginning to fall apart in your hands, it's probably better just to place it into an acid-free folder. Um, I don't have a PDF prepared myself for anybody, but if you go to the NEDC website, NEDCC website, or if you go to the National Park Service website, 
Um, they have a ton of information, a lot of what I've said today that you can print out. Um, also, if you are in Galveston and you come and pick up one of those kits, those have a handout as well that contains a lot of this information that I've talked about today. Um, so if you're in the area, make sure you get to the library and pick up that kit because it will have a, a handout. But if not, go to one of those websites and print out a conservagram or one of those preservation sheets um, that will contain a lot of useful information. Okay, is there any other questions that I might be able to answer for today? I'm not seeing anything, but I'm gonna put our department email um, one more time. It's GTHC. Oops. You can see it right here on my screen. I, it's not sending for some reason. GTHC at rosenberg-library.org. If you have any questions, um, feel free to email that account and I'll be able to answer to you. If you have a question about the links, I'll be able to send those to you. Um, thank you, Kevin. It's GTHC at rosenberg-library.org. If you have any questions, feel free to send us an email. Um, and I'll, I'll be able to answer that or point you in the right direction. But I thank you everyone for listening today. I hope you enjoyed it. And next week, Jamie Durham will be talking about historic homes, historic properties. So I highly recommend signing up for that. It's gonna be the same time, 11 o'clock. And then the week after, Sharon Gillens of the Moody Foundation will talk. We'll be talking about community archives. As I said, um, there's only so much we can do in our home environment, but archives, such as our own, um, can do a lot more because we have the means to have things um, in cold storage with adequate humidity levels and so on. So she's going to focus on um, saving your community stories, community history, and the importance of placing things in archives um, so that these materials are saved for future generations and accessible to future generations so that people can learn about the past. So thank you so much. And you all have a wonderful day. Thank you.